Okay, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and what you do here at AIM. My name's Cliff Kincaid. I'm the editor of the Accuracy in Media AIM Report, our twice a month newsletter. I'm the editor of that, plus I write a weekly column and uh, radio scripts uh, that we call Media Monitor, uh, which are distributed to uh, uh, radio stations around the country. Okay, and so when you uh, take an issue of, of liberal bias in the media, can you kind of give me an overview of uh, what you mean by that? The liberal bias is reflected in what is called the mainstream media. Uh, we take a look at the major newspapers, the broadcasting networks, uh, we've been doing this for decades. It's a bias that can best be summarized as a pro-democratic party bias associated with the views articulated by the Democratic Party. And that's fair enough. We just think people ought to know uh, when they're getting bias and when mistakes are made, the media ought to correct those mistakes. Uh, I'm a journalist myself. I, I, I have a degree uh, that encompassed uh, uh, concentration in communications and journalism and I know from personal experience when I took my uh, journalism classes even then and uh, I hope I'm not getting too far in past history but my journalism textbook was called Interpretive Reporting uh, by Curtis McDougall uh, and we try to make the point uh, to our readers and to the public that what the American people are getting is not old-fashioned objective news reporting. They are getting uh, interpretive reporting. This is what's been taught for decades, and we see that reflected in coverage of uh, foreign policy, uh, domestic and social issues as well. And again, the liberal bias is reflected in how, uh, mainly when it comes to our national media, uh, they adopt the positions associated with the National Democratic Party. And if you look at uh, the instances of during the buildup to the war in Iraq, how do you use the liberal media bias to predict the behavior of what was happening? What we anticipated was that the media uh, would question or uh, run articles and stories questioning the administration's policy, and they did some of that. Uh, there was also quite a bit of reporting about the administration's case and how they presented it. We really saw the bias in particular in coverage of uh, the so-called anti-war protests that were occurring before the war and after the war started. Uh, we saw a definite liberal bias in terms of a failure uh, to tell the American people and the public who was actually behind these demonstrations. The public was told that these were just ordinary people, uh, uh, ordinary Americans, when in fact we have documented in our reports uh, that uh, actual communist organizations were mainly behind them. Uh, the uh, Workers World Party, for example, working through an international front organization uh, called International Answer, put on several of the demonstrations in Washington, D.C. Uh, we questioned the Washington Post repeatedly, uh, not only uh, with uh, letters and, and questions and emails, but I went to the annual meeting of the Washington Post and asked why they would not tell the truth about the communists behind these demonstrations. This is important because we saw the same kind of slanted journalism during the Vietnam War when Hanoi was manipulating the so-called anti-war movement here, uh, but by and large the media would not report uh, how the enemy was active uh, on the home front. Now, can you describe to me the difference between a correlation and causation? In terms of what? In just because they were correlated, you know, how, how do you eliminate the possibility that people were just going to these anti-war rallies, that they had no official connection? They were correlated, but they weren't being caused to go to these rallies because they were necessarily communists. Well, we never said that ordinary people who simply attended the demonstrations were communists. We had no evidence of that. But we did have evidence uh, that International Answer, for example, was a front group of the Workers' World Party. And no question about that. We had the names of the people, their associations, their backgrounds. We presented that information to the major media, including the Washington Post, uh, which uh, declined to report it uh, uh, for the most part. There was one uh, 
not reporter, but columnist, Michael Kelly, who actually did a, a story, a column, in the Washington Post about this, but that was the exception uh, to the rule. Kelly went into detail about the fact that, it, that the Workers' World Party was behind the anti-war protests in Washington, D.C. Incidentally, Michael Kelly happened to have died uh, during the war in Iraq, and we at the annual meeting of the Washington Post uh, uh, expressed our, our, our sadness and, and condolences over his passing. Uh, he was a tremendous journalist, uh, but, uh, but he was a columnist. He was not a news reporter, and we were trying to make sure that uh, news was being presented accurately about who was actually behind the protests because those people who were coming thinking that uh, this was a sincere uh, effort to stop the war in Iraq uh, may have been misled. Uh, they may not have attended if they had known that hardcore communists who had traveled to Havana, Cuba, Pyongyang, uh, North Korea, and even Baghdad, Iraq, had been behind organizing these very protests. And when you look at the actual uh, coverage, though, there was lots of other things that they did not cover. So when you look at what they actually did cover, how do you see a liberal bias in what the coverage that they did cover? All I can comment on are specific examples. If you have some, I'd be happy to comment on them. But I've just given you a specific example of where not only the Washington Post, but the New York Times and the networks uh, failed uh, to go into detail about hardcore communists who sympathize with the enemies of the United States actually organizing uh, these anti-war protests. If you have some other examples, I'd be happy well, to... I, I guess the, uh, the specifics um, are, you know, for example, on March 7th, you know, Mohamed al Baradei said that the aluminum tubes were not for nuclear weapons the destruction and so then, or for development, for centrifuge development, but at the same time the United States government had said we have a 10-day ultimatum and so that report that uh, al Baradei had said that these aluminum tubes are fishy was not covered. I don't know if it was or not, uh, that particular comment by some UN official. Uh, all I know is that uh, in the uh, months leading up to the war, uh, there was a lot of discussion and debate, uh, not only in the press, uh, but in the Congress of the United States. And the Congress ultimately voted for the war. Uh, those who voted for the war included uh, uh, Senator John Kerry. Uh, many Democrats voted for the war against Iraq. Uh, operating on the same basic information available to the President of the United States as well as to many reporters. Uh, they knew about uh, El Barade, they knew about the UN's view on this, and, and they decided uh, to vote for the war. Uh, I don't think there was a lack of information. You can cite maybe a specific statement by some UN official here or there that didn't get the prominence you think it deserves, but to say that uh, the American people were somehow denied information about the stakes or about uh, what going to war meant, I think is, is really unfair and inaccurate. How could the Congress know about Alberta when they weren't even in Iraq in October? The con Congress voted on o October 10th and 11th. Well, I d the Congress knew about the UN's uh, position on Iraq. They knew that the UN Security Council had voted unanimously warning Saddam Hussein about the need to disarm or else he would face serious consequences. Uh, the Congress knew about that. They knew about the UN view. They knew about the views of various officials. Uh, the fact is that the U.S. Congress decided to vote to support President Bush to go to war. Whether, whether they were aware in particular of how much coverage El Baradei got about one statement about aluminum tubes, I frankly don't know and I don't think it's relevant. Everybody knew the stakes involved when we went into that war. It was adequately covered, uh, but what wasn't adequately covered was the nature of the enemy and how the, the enemy would be deployed on U.S. soil to try to undermine support for the war effort. That's where the liberal media really fell down on the job. They didn't tell the truth about the communists sympathetic to Baghdad who were behind these anti-war protests. Now, just looking at the timeline, can you tell me when the congressional vote happened and when the UN Security Council 1441 was passed? I don't have those figures in front of me, but the, I don't... The UN 
vote was after the congressional vote. So how can the, the Congress know about the UN resolution when it wasn't even passed until 11, November 8th? I the, mean, con the Congress was fully aware of the UN position on Iraq. The UN had been failing to uphold its resolutions on Iraq for 10 years. The, the important point was the President went to the Congress first. He got congressional backing and then it was presented to the UN and they backed him unanimously in the UN Security Council. The, the Congress was fully aware of the UN position on Iraq and the fact that the inspectors had been uh, effectively kicked out in 1998. I don't think something Alberade said later uh, would have made any difference at all because uh, we were operating on the basis of what our own intelligence agencies and foreign intelligence agencies and the UN had provided us. In, so uh, from your knowledge of Resolution 1441, what is your expertise about international law or what international lawyers have you spoken to to get interpretation? Well, I've, I actually run a separate organization that deals with UN problems and it, it's important to consider the international perspective but the fact is as Americans under our Constitution we have a Congress that decides on matters of war and peace. Uh, Bush went to the UN as a courtesy uh, to try to urge them to, to uh, implement their own resolutions. Uh, but personally speaking, I didn't think there was any need for that. Under our Constitution, it's the U.S. Congress that makes these decisions. And what Alberade might say later is really beside the point. As Americans, we have uh, to enforce our own Constitution. And, and Bush, to his credit, went before the Congress and he presented them the same information that was given to him and he found that uh, by overwhelming margins they decided to go to support him uh, in the event that he went to war and that included even Senator Kerry and many, many leading Democrats. And so when you look at uh, after the uh, resolution was, was passed in the Congress, then what you're saying ultimately is that uh, international law is seen as a statute and trumped by the War Powers Act? Or just, it, in other words, what, what is your viewpoint on getting explicit authorization from the United Nations? My viewpoint is the U, under our Constitution the, the President is, is simply not required to go to the UN for approval before we go to war. Okay, and um, so d from your... And I think any objective uh, uh, analysis of the issue would, would support that. Uh, to say that we couldn't act in our own interest uh, until we got the approval of the UN is a far left point of view held by very few people in this country and certainly very few in the US Congress. I mean you may find people like Barbara Lee or Bernie Sanders who, who hold that view but I'd be at a loss to name any more than that. But after the war it seems like there, we needed international help with the, you know, in Iraq, that it would have been beneficial politically to get a UN resolution. So legally it may not be an issue, but what about politically? President Bush did get a UN resolution. So go into... How, but he didn't need to. How did the 1441 authorize war? It threatened uh, serious consequences of Saddam I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not going to, I'm going to be erasing my my question, so just... Uh, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, was threatened with serious consequences if he didn't disarm. You see, you have to understand the burden of proof was on Saddam Hussein to prove he didn't have these weapons of mass destruction. He did not prove that. He did not prove he did not have those weapons and co consequently President Bush uh, challenged the UN to act, but failing that he acted alone after getting the support of the U.S. Congress. That's entirely consistent with the U.S. Constitution and I don't think any American could expect anything more than that. Uh, most, most Americans certainly, after realizing the extent of the so-called oil for food scandal involving Saddam Hussein and apparently Kofi Annan's son, would think that the U.N. ought to have veto power over what the U.S. does internationally. And so when you look at the behavior of France, uh, and what, what comments do you have in regards to the opposition that we were facing? There, uh, the phenomenon of anti-Americanism around the world in France and other countries 
is a reality. Uh, Jean-Francois Ravel wrote a recent book on anti-Americanism, and he refers to this as an obsession in Europe. Uh, we have to face up to that, but uh, that kind of obsession is evident even in the United States. I certainly saw it when I covered uh, these so-called anti-war rallies in Washington, D.C., uh, attended and organized by people who thought uh, President Bush was more of a threat to the world than Saddam Hussein. Uh, this anti-Americanism we see in France and other countries is uh, something that goes back a long, a long ways. Uh, it, it's a reality, it's a fact, uh, and uh, the U.S. And, and the media have to deal with it and explain it. And uh, John Agaponte sent a letter to uh, the United Nations on March 20th laying out the legal justification and I was wondering if you could, if you are familiar enough with the legal justification to explain the U.S. position that, they, that he laid out. Well, I'm not here to explain the U.S. position. I thought you wanted to talk about media coverage of the war leading up to the war. Uh, but I will say that under our Constitution, uh, there was no need for Negro Ponte to send a letter to the UN. He may have done that as a courtesy, but it's certainly not required under, under the U.S. Constitution. Uh, the U.S. Constitution sets out the requirements whereby the United States goes to war, and President Bush complied with those. And so when you look at, you know, the hook that I'm looking at is that there were the, the coverage of international law uh, that uh, that the, the media, that the Bush administration was saying that this is our interpretation of international law. The media was repeating that, but have you asked the the consensus within the scholarly community of international lawyers what they think of it? We have covered that in so far as um, I'm, I'm sorry, covered what? We have covered uh, the international aspect uh, and and the view of those international lawyers who somehow think that the U.S. violated international law is interesting and it deserves some attention, but I don't see how it's relevant to the constitutional processes under which the United States went to war. Uh, that's something, I suppose, for academic journals, uh, but for the United States, which operates on the basis of a U.S. Constitution, uh, what some international lawyers may think is almost irrelevant. I think it's relevant in the sense that the evidence that the administration was presenting from August o two up until October of o two uh, that's I could you can make a legitimate case that it was the intelligence fault but after that point after the weapons inspectors are on the ground you have uh, them going to places that US intelligence have told them to go to find these weapons they weren't there aluminum tubes discredited by Al Baraday, Niger documents discredited uh, all this evidence is, is falling apart and that you have an international skepticism towards the evidence presented as a casus belli to go to war, but yet it fell apart. Even under the UN's own charter, if you want to keep on that tact, uh, there is a right for nations to engage in self-defense. Uh, and I think the president, if he chose to, could cite uh, that particular part of the UN charter in justifying uh, the U.S. going to war in Iraq. But I repeat, the critical point is that uh, the U.S. went to the, uh, US, the president went to the Congress of the United States and got a justification there. That's where the media had an obligation, I believe, to make sure the president did not commit U.S. forces without the support, as required under the Constitution, of the U.S. Congress. Now, if you want to get into a discussion of how the evidence uh, for the war was treated, I think events have shown uh, that uh, the president's uh, evidence uh, was, was pretty solid. Uh, it's premature to say that uh, there was a massive intelligence failure because stockpiles of weapons have not yet been discovered. Uh, to say that was an intelligence failure presumes that we know what happened to the weapons. How do we know that the weapons of mass destruction have not been transferred to another country? How do we know that the weapons of mass destruction are still not buried in Iraq somewhere? We do know that David Kay, who headed the Iraq survey group, uh, testified after just three months of looking that there was enough evidence that he found to show that Iraq was in violation of the UN resolutions that so many are so concerned about and that Iraq did have a banned 
programs, uh, weapons of mass destruction programs. Uh, Charles Delfer, who took over from David Kay as head of the Iraq Survey Group, has said that uh, they are still looking at reports of uh, underground or buried uh, caches of weapons, that uh, weapons of mass destruction may still be buried in Iraq. David Kay said himself that there were reports of mysterious shipments and trucks uh, going out of Iraq uh, before the war uh, that could conceivably have carried some of the WMD uh, to neighboring countries. So don't compound this claim of an uh, intelligence failure by presuming to know that there were not in fact any weapons because we don't really know for sure that they aren't hidden somewhere or have been transferred, transferred to uh, neighboring states. As far as uh, the nuclear program is concerned, uh, Mr. Dulfer has confirmed that Iraq did have a prohibited nuclear weapons program. Uh, the President's statement in the State of the Union address about uh, citing a British report that Iraq was seeking uranium from Africa was absolutely true. It was absolutely true from the time he made it to the time that we're talking today. In fact, Joe Wilson, the ambassador who was sent over by his CIA-employed wife to look into this question, actually confirmed that Iraq was seeking uranium from Africa. But he did not emphasize that part of his report when he went public and tried to bash the Bush administration. So the fact is that Saddam Hussein had a nuclear weapons program. He was seeking uranium from Africa, and he was trying to reconstitute this program. Uh, and the president had that information. He provided that information to the American people and the Congress, and it has stood the test of time. But when you look at the actual legal case that the Bush administration made to the UN, they didn't try to argue for self-defense. Well, that's, that's up to them. I'm just saying as a journalist who understands the UN Charter and the U.S. Constitution uh, that the UN Charter authorizes nation states to exercise the right of self-defense. If the president had chosen to rely on that, he could have cited that. Perhaps he cited the UN resolutions themselves a as a reason to go to war. Uh, that's their call. That's not mine. I'm just saying as a reporter, as a journalist, uh, there was plenty in the uh, UN Charter that could have justified the war uh, on its own. But the key is that the president went to Congress. But when you, as a journalist, when the president says, I have previous authorization because of 678 and 687, shouldn't you dig into that and see if that's actually true? Yes. I think that's worthy of, of attention and comment. But as I say, the critical issue is, did he have the support of the American people in Congress? And he did. So that's, that's, all, that's all that matters? In a, in a that's not all that matters, but it's the most important because under our Constitution, uh, the President uh, has to go to Congress when he goes to war, not to the UN. Now, from my reading of the, the press performance, after October 11th, they didn't matter if it was a matter of if, it was a matter of when. Do you see that as well? That the media was just counting down to war? Um, I, you'd have to be more specific I, I, in terms of reports or stories or reporters. Uh, I, I can't say as a general rule. I mean, basically, I think most people understood that a showdown was coming. Uh, but again, the president went to the Congress for the justification or the authorization for war, and he got it. And, and the burden all along, even if you want to cite uh, the UN as a sacred cow, uh, was on Saddam Hussein uh, to disarm. The burden of proof was on him uh, to prove he did not have those weapons of mass destruction, to prove that he had uh, dismantled or destroyed them. He did not provide that proof. Well, shouldn't the United States prove proof that he does have them in order to go to war? That wasn't the way it worked. Uh, I'm again, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, under, under the UN resolutions that so many people put so much stock in, uh, the burden was on Saddam Hussein uh, to prove that he didn't have those weapons. Plus, uh, especially after 9-11, uh, the president was not, I think, prepared uh, to give the benefit of, a, of the doubt to Saddam Hussein to think that, well, he may not have those weapons, therefore uh, we shouldn't act. He had plenty of evidence. He had uh, 
plenty of evidence not only about uh, an Iraqi nuclear weapons program, but of course, as he uh, stated many times, and the UN had confirmed this as well, Saddam Hussein had used chemical weapons before. He had invaded uh, another country. Uh, so uh, the president, I think, uh, put forward his case. I think it was subjected to scrutiny uh, by the press. Uh, I think the press fell down on its job, though, in reporting the nature of the so-called anti-war movement that emerged in the United States in opposition to the war. But that wasn't the majority of their coverage. If you look at how much coverage happened between August of 2002 and March of 2003, the anti-war, there was only five anti-war rallies that trickled on the Saturdays, and then it may have uh, seeped over. But the majority of the coverage, if you want to talk about majority of coverage, and you want to prove a liberal bias, it just, I don't see it. Well, I, as I say, we, I covered personally all of these so-called anti-war demonstrations, and I documented the bias uh, in the AIM report, our twice-a-month newsletter. We examined how these rallies were covered uh, by the Washington Post, New York Times, and the, and the big TV networks. Sure, these rallies weren't occurring every day of the week, but these were big rallies. Uh, they got a lot of attention, and most of the attention was very, very sympathetic, uh, suggesting that the people behind these rallies uh, uh, were in favor of peace and against war generally, when the fact is that hardcore communists had organized and manipulated them, uh, people who despise the United States, who hate America, and want to see America destroyed. These are hardcore communists in the Workers' World Party who sympathize with Castro, uh, Saddam Hussein, and, uh, and other enemies of America. We thought that information should have been reported to the American people, and in far too many cases it wasn't. And so do you see a general, you know, I see, I'm looking at television news media, and I see that there is a general lack of debate on anything, any subject. They can't handle complexity at all. And it's not just this doesn't mean they're liberal bias. They can't c handle a complex issue of, you know, why are we going to war? Or, you know, like, there's... Well, I don't, know, I don't know what you were reading or hearing, but I think there was plenty of discussion of why we were going to war many months past before we ever uh, went to war. Uh, I can cite specific examples of where the media fell down on the job in terms of telling the truth about who was behind the anti-war protests. But generally speaking, uh, the debate over the war, uh, whether to go or not, was covered extensively. And the Congress uh, was able to make a decision. Uh, there may be some specific information somebody has that they think wasn't reported by some outlet somewhere, and that may be the case. Uh, but uh, I don't think the case can be made that uh, we rushed into war so quickly uh, that there wasn't adequate discussion or debate or, or coverage in the media. So uh, why, from your sense, why did we go to war in Iraq? I think the president made the case that after 9-11, uh, in, uh, in exercising the right of self-defense, the U.S. could not wait until an imminent threat developed. And there was enough evidence about Saddam Hussein's intentions uh, and designs and weapons that the president felt and believed he had to take action almost immediately. Although he did, and there are many conservatives who question this, he did give the UN a chance to take action first. There are many conservatives who think the president waited too long. Uh, perhaps that wait, while he gave the, chance a U chance, uh, gave the UN a chance to respond, uh, gave uh, Saddam Hussein the opportunity to either bury or transfer some of the weapons of mass destruction, which may still be hidden somewhere or may have been transferred out of the country. Again, we don't know for sure. Uh, but the president has been criticized, not in the liberal press, but by conservatives, uh, some conservatives, for waiting too long. Uh, so there's no, there was no rush to war. The president made his case, uh, the pre and the Congress backed him. From your sense, when do you think the decision was made to go to war? I have no idea. I don't know for sure. Uh, all you can do is read the books that have come out, uh, the, uh, the coverage, and, and go on the basis of, of what has been reported. Uh, I don't have a firm opinion on that. I don't know exactly when he decided to go to war. Uh, it had to have happened sometime 
uh, after the UN uh, gave Saddam Hussein an ultimatum, ultimatum and the president decided uh, that Saddam was not going to move forward and uh, prove uh, that he didn't have the WMD. But if you look at the legal case, after uh, December 18th is when uh, they had gotten the uh, declaration that they declared was unfinished and the scientists were not providing immediate interviews. And that's the only basis of the uh, ceasefire breach that they're claiming. So after, it wasn't until that's, uh, Colin Powell came out and said that uh, they have not, we, are, have, we have serious concerns about the fullness and accuracy of this uh, declaration that they made on December 7th. That's the only standard. It's not has nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction. It has everything to do with the arbitrary claims made in 1441. What the UN required was proof that Saddam Hussein uh, was going to disarm, that he was going to abandon weapons of mass destruction. That proof was not uh, provided. But that aside, uh, Bush went to the UN as a courtesy to that world body. What counted was he had the authorization of the U.S. Congress to act. Uh, for, for people to dwell on what the UN did or didn't do or what international lawyers think is really beside the point for Americans who operate on the basis of a constitution. And why did the administration shift the focus to a humanitarian focus? Or, and talk to some of the, the benefits of the war in Iraq that you see from your perspective. Our concern has been that the coverage should be accurate. There has been too much coverage after the invasion of this weapons of mass destruction controversy when, as I say, the President's controversial statement in the State of the Union address about Iraq seeking uranium from Africa was absolutely right, was absolutely correct. As the President him himself has said, uh, no stockpiles of weapons have yet been found. But there's no reason uh, to believe uh, that they won't be found. Uh, if you were to come to a premature conclusion about the WMD, you yourself could be guilty of another intelligence failure. As I say, we don't know for sure whether they are buried somewhere, whether they have been transferred out of the country. At the same time, it's clear that one of the justifications for the war that was covered uh, by the press is that uh, uh, we were going to liberate 25 million people from a cruel tyrant uh, who had uh, killed hundreds of thousands of people and had uh, maintained torture chambers. Uh, that's certainly part of it. But when the president went to Congress, I do think the main justification was that Iraq could be a national security threat to the United States. I think that was the prominent justification of the war, and I think it's still valid even at this point. And when you, uh, as a journalist, and you're trying to independently verify information or just track it down, when you look at a uh, white paper from the White House uh, saying, listing the humanitarian, uh, actual, the, uh, the violations of humanitarian law, basically uh, war crimes that Saddam had committed, um, have you tracked the, down those sources of... Well, let me tell you what the White House is trying to do. The White House is reacting to media criticism uh, over the uh, so-called missing WMD. So the White House decides to emphasize the humanitarian aspect of the war, the fact that we liberated these people and eliminated the torture chambers and, and we have Saddam Hussein in custody. This is an important point because it shows how sensitive the White House is to media criticism. If you look, for example, at the uh, controversy over former Ambassador Joseph Wilson, you'll see that the administration was on the defensive in regard to his claims, which turned out to be phony, for over a year. The administration uh, backed away and even said at one point that those, quote, 16 words about Iraq seeking uranium from Africa shouldn't have been in the State of the Union address. Why? Even though the statement was true, the White House backed away under an intensive media assault. 
uh, the White House was on the defensive. That explains uh, a white paper on the humanitarian aspect of this whole thing. The White House gets scared when the power of the liberal media is unleashed against uh, this administration. They should have fought back. They should have fought the media bias more forthrightly, but they chose not to do it because they were intimidated. They were scared. Uh, they got put on the defensive when, in fact, the president's statement and the State of the Union address is still true, even after Joseph Wilson has been on the evening news programs, uh, I forget the exact count, probably 50 or 60 times, and has been in the major newspapers probably over 100 times. Now he's been completely discredited, and the administration is still uh, refusing to make its own case. Uh, this is a fact of life in Washington, uh, faced with a media onslaught, the sharks in the water. Uh, any administration uh, tends to go on the defensive and backpedals. But this white paper, you're assuming, i referring to a white paper that was released after the war. This was released on September 12, 2002. The, I'm, I'm asking if you, I'm familiar with this white paper and have tracked down those footnotes. I don't think I've tracked down every particular document out of the White House. I'm telling you that the justification of the war on humanitarian grounds uh, has been cited all along and has been more prominent in the, in the aftermath of the war rather than the lead up to it. And that's my point in a way, is that they didn't bring the humanitarian, there is legitimate humanitarian intervention, but they didn't make that case either before to the Congress or to the UN. Right. I think that's true, but uh, there were various reasons for going to war, and the administration uh, thought that the national security threat uh, was more prominent. Obviously, the United States could go to war in many places around the world strictly on humanitarian grounds, and we just don't do it for various reasons. But in this case, uh, the humanitarian reason was one, but certainly not not the biggest. Uh, I, I don't know what was said in any particular white paper going into the humanitarian reasons for the intervention, uh, but uh, whatever the administration said on that point has been backed up by the soldiers who are in Iraq who have come back and who have talked about uh, in very positive terms what they're doing for the people there and how the people appreciate what the United States has done for them in freeing them from this dictator. As a journalist, if you were to get an expert opinion on humanitarian intervention, who would you go to? An expert opinion on humanitarian intervention. There are lawyers in town at the firm of Hunton and Williams uh, who deal with some of the international law uh, problems. Uh, they would be good. Uh, there are people on the left like Marjorie Cohn, who I've talked to on the radio, who might be good. There's people on both sides, uh, people at the Center for Constitutional Rights uh, on the left uh, versus uh, the Heritage Foundation on the right. There are plenty of those, quote, experts to go to, but that begs the question of whether the international justification for this war was the most important one. It was not. It, I guess the, the, where I'm going on these, the line of questioning is that if you would follow the the footnotes, most of them go back to Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the UN Special Rapporteur. Very little first-hand reporting on the humanitarian atrocities that, that happened. And when I went to Human Rights Watch and asked them uh, their opinion, they say you shouldn't consider Iraq humanitarian intervention because there is no evidence that there was a, a imminent genocide or ongoing genocide. No one even attempted to provide any of that evidence. The opinion of Human Rights Watch on whether the war in Iraq was justified or not is really beside the point. Uh, the humanitarian justification had to do with going to war to liberate the people of Iraq, not whether we could prove under the UN's genocide treaty that Saddam was committing genocide. As I say, though, the humanitarian aspect was not predominant in the array of arguments that were used before going to war. It is certainly a very beneficial and positive side effect of the liberation of Iraq that we've put an end to the killing of hundreds of thousands of people, an end to the torture chambers. 
But the primary reason cited by the president and backed up by the Congress in going to war was to eliminate a possible national security threat to the United States. And uh, from your reading, did you, when, you, when they say the uh, regime change is official U.S. foreign policy, who sets the foreign policy of the United States? Well, that particular policy was set by the Congress of the United States uh, under the Clinton administration and in a bill that was signed by President Clinton, that, that official uh, policy of regime change in Iraq. Uh, that's how it works under the U.S. Constitution without regard to what happens at the U.N. The president uh, decides, makes policy uh, with the advice and consent of the Congress of the United States. So regime change had been an official U.S. policy uh, since in Iraq since the Clinton administration. And uh, that's, that's the distinction that I want to make is did the Congress set the policy or was it the president that set the official policy? The Congress passed the bill and President Clinton signed it. That uh, was official U.S. policy. Now, that doesn't mean that you take in any particular approach to affecting regime change in Iraq. Obviously, President Clinton never authorized a full-blown invasion of Iraq, although he did authorize uh, various bombing campaigns uh, in Iraq. Uh, uh, but it was under President Bush, obviously, that the United States went to war uh, to affect regime change. Oh, and do you have criticisms of uh, Clinton's uh, attacking um, in Desert Operation Desert Fox? And I think uh, at that time uh, there were questions about whether uh, that could have been a wag the dog operation and whether that particular bombing campaign had any real effect. Uh, there were questions raised about uh, the justification for that. Uh, president, the president at the time was probably on legal ground to do it only because under the War Powers Act he can commit our forces for a certain length of time before he asked to uh, seek congressional approval. Uh, but uh, questions about the motives uh, still remain even today. And, and when I was looking over Ames' website, I'm not sure if this came from you or someone else, but I saw a, a little phrase that said the illegal war in Yugoslavia. And do you share that, that opinion? Yes, I wrote, a, I wrote extensively about that. It was an illegal war in Yugoslavia. Uh, under the U.S. Constitution and under U.S. law without regard to the U.N. And the reason is that uh, President Clinton committed our forces uh, against Yugoslavia even though the House of Representatives later voted not to authorize that war. Uh, that made it illegal under the War Powers Act. Uh, so that was clearly an illegal war. Now. I think probably, uh, if I go back in my memory, I remember talking to various so-called international experts who would reaffirm that even under international law. But my point is that the president has to follow the U.S. Constitution and U.S. law. Clinton did not do so in the Kosovo case. When the House of Representatives voted not to authorize that war, uh, legally he should have brought our troops back. He should have withdrawn our troops uh, from, from the NATO operation in Yugoslavia. He did not do so. That was an illegal war. And I guess uh, there's a uh, hierarchy question because international law, once it's ratified by the Congress, does become domestic law. So should we follow, uh, if, if there's a trumping action, if, if the War Powers Act is higher than the statute of an international law, we should ignore that? I don't think uh, there's any evidence that an international treaty or so-called international law would trump U.S. law. I think U.S. law and the U.S. Constitution always uh, remain uh, preeminent. And that's why I don't cite anything the U.N. did uh, to say that uh, Clinton's war in Kosovo was illegal. It was illegal under U.S. law. Not only did Clinton not get the approval of Congress before he went to war, he kept our troops involved in that war after the U.S. Congress failed to authorize it. That was clearly illegal and unconstitutional on Clinton's part. That's very different than what President Bush did in regard to Iraq. President Bush got the authorization of the Congress 
in overwhelming numbers before we went to war. And when you look at uh, the media as an institution and you are criticizing them, how, in your experience, do they react to constructive criticism? The media react to criticism on different levels. Uh, I guess by human nature, like most people, uh, we don't like to be criticized. Uh, but one thing we try to do at Accuracy in Media is if we get criticized and we find the criticism is valid, we will cor correct our errors immediately. We don't find that's the case with most in the media. Just to give you one recent example, uh, we had uh, uh, criticized USA Today for running a very favorable story. Uh, pardon me. We had criticized USA Today for running a ver very favorable story about the Joe Wilson book, uh, ironically titled The Politics of Truth, uh, in which he uh, criticized Vice President Cheney uh, as being a traitor to the United States. And we uh, confronted USA Today editor Ken Paulson at the annual meeting of Gannett, the parent company of USA Today, saying, don't you think you should have at least gone to Vice President Cheney for a response, for a comment. Uh, he admitted uh, that that was true, and he later said in an email message to me uh, that his criticism of that piece was that it was not fair in that respect, that they did not go to Vice President Cheney for a response to this uh, gross charge that Cheney was somehow a traitor uh, to his country. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, Mr. Paulson did not uh, put any credence in some of our other criticisms uh, of USA Today. Uh, so our record can be mixed. Sometimes uh, some media are more open to criticism than others. Sometimes we see uh, corrections of the record. Uh, but the reason we have a twice a month newsletter and a daily radio program and a weekly column is to put out uh, our point of view about omissions, inaccuracies, and distortions, and to put the burden on the media uh, to police themselves. And when, did you uh, watch a, a lot of uh, television coverage leading up to the war? And I was wondering if you could take, let's say, for example, a White House beat and, and describe to me how, in the build up to the war in Iraq, how liberal bias played out in the White House beats. Well, I couldn't give you a chapter and verse on any particular reporter at this point. We covered the media uh, in specific cases when something came to our attention, and of course we publicized that in our AIM report. Uh, but granted, there's a lot out there that we... Let me just... We, ha we covered the buildup to the war uh, in terms of specifics, but also the general tone. All of this, of course, was published in our twice a month newsletter, media monitors, our daily radio commentaries, and our weekly columns. Uh, one incident we focused on in particular during the war, uh, of course, was what happened when Peter Arnett, formerly of CNN, who went to MSNBC. Well, let me just interrupt, just because I'm stopping on March 19th. Okay. So I'm looking at, during the buildup, and I'm just any examples that you can think of, either White House, State Department, or, or uh, Defense Department, kind of give me your best argument for liberal bias during this, this time period. Our argument of, in terms of the liberal bias that we documented uh, was mainly involving the failure to tell the truth about who was behind these anti-war protests. The reason I keep focusing in on that is that I covered those demonstrations myself. I've been here in Washington for 25 years. I know how these things work. I've covered demonstrations for two decades. I know the names of the players. And we focused in on that because the failures of the liberal media were so blatant, were so obvious at least to me, as someone who was there, who covered these uh, activities. Uh, well, and let me just interrupt, because I've got that you know, two or three other times. I want to ask you, like, how do you eliminate all of the possibilities that they were just too lazy, or that they uh, had already decided that war was going to happen and it didn't matter to even say what, these, what was going on? 
It's well, a real politic approach. Of well, what, the fact is that reporters can be lazy. Uh, they are not open to criticism as well. And we give them an opportunity to respond to our criticisms. Uh, we send letters to the editor. We go to the annual meetings. We ask questions of their top editors and publishers. We sometimes contact the reporters themselves. Uh, we try to get answers. Uh, was it just laziness? Uh, was it a bias? Uh, and it's very difficult to get them to put an explanation on the record. But the fact is that liberal media bias has been a fact of life in, in the United States and especially in Washington, D.C. and New York for decades. We have studies and surveys, and I'm sure you're going to cite some of those in your film, uh, demonstrate, demonstrating how this goes back to the time of FDR. The fact is that the journalism profession has been very open to those who have a liberal a bias that is reflected in the uh, activities and policies and issues and agenda of the National Democratic Party. This isn't a surprise. This isn't big news. Even the Pew Research Center recently came out with a study uh, noting how few conservatives are actually in uh, the national media. It is incredible how few conservatives go into the profession and are represented there today. It, I think it, if you look at Oh, let me just get my, my train of thought. Wait. Okay. Right, yeah. I think. I, I got to go quickly. Okay. Uh, like five minutes. Uh, when, yeah, just is there anything else that you can borrow off the research of Media Research Center or, you know, I just when, during the buildup, I see that the, uh, the coverage being driven by the White House, the reverse inverted pyramid, if you look at the actual coverage, of the White House, State Department, Defense Department, it's going to be dictated and predictive of the senior administration officials. Uh, whatever uh, President Bush says, whatever Secretary Rumsfeld says, whatever Secretary Powell says, that's going to be the headline. And to me, that doesn't indicate a, a liberal media bias. Well, the media have an obligation to report the facts. Sometimes they do that within the context of their own bias. They certainly cannot ignore what the executive branch is doing. We would fault them if they did ignore what the president said. The American people deserve the full truth about what the president is saying about Iraq. That should be news. But I find no evidence that the media went out of their way to pump up or promote the administration's case for going to war to the degree to the extent that there were critics of the administration in the Congress, they got attention, they got publicity, but the administration at any particular time, uh, whether it's a Republican or Democratic administration, is going to get coverage. That's the nature uh, of what happens here in Washington, D.C., but the Congress is covered as well. And then I think the media, to try to, quote, balance out that coverage, perhaps because they thought it was too administration, would go and cover these anti-war protests as, this, as if this somehow represented the true sentiments of the American people. That's where we focused our attention because the coverage was so bad, was so flawed in terms of, uh, you can say it was laziness, but I can't believe that explains how, after demonstration after demonstration, the facts about the communists who organized the demonstrations was ignored. But they do cover what the administration says, but a lot of times there's not skeptical opinions incorporated within the, the own beat reports of the White House, State Department, or the Pentagon. And well, so I, I don't it's the acceptance of the framing that Iraq is the biggest threat. When I've talked to nuclear non-proliferation experts who say that, in fact, Iran and North Korea are a bigger threat. So you're accepting the framing of the administration when the, the media's role is to challenge power, is it not? I don't think there's any evidence that the reporters for the Washington Post or the New York Times, which are big, liberal, Democratic Party papers, uh, gave too much leeway or prominence to what the Republican Bush administration was saying. There's just no evidence of that at all. These reporters who are covering the White House or the Pentagon or other beats for the Washington Post and the New York Times are liberals. They are associated with the views of the National Democratic Party. All the surveys 
show that the, the major papers are dom and the networks are dominated by liberals who are associated with the National Democratic Party. Uh, to say that they went into the tank for the Bush administration, I think is laughable. If you look at Daniel Okrent or Michael Gettler, or even on some of their admissions, apologizing, that's your evidence. They said we were not, we, our coverage was not as rigorous as it should have been. Those people who are trying to apologize for a so-called pro-war slant to the coverage are just plain wrong. They are wrong. And for the New York Times to issue a virtual apology over their coverage leading up to the war is laughable. Uh, the New York Times went out of its way for some strange reason, which I'll get into, to bash some of their own reporters, when their own reporters were simply reporting the facts based on the available intelligence and information. What was the reason for the New York Times, or for the Washington Post for that matter, uh, trying to apologize for how they covered the war or the events leading up to the war, they had come under attack by the liberals and the left-wingers who didn't want to go to war. And they could see a bias somehow in the coverage leading up to the war. These papers had been attacked unmercilessly uh, by liberal activists in groups like Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting who tried to hit them over the head saying, oh, you were too much pro-administration, you were too pro-Bush. This was all a political strategy on the part of those uh, who opposed the war to draw, try to discredit these newspapers. And unfortunately, uh, you had, in the case of uh, the New York Times, their new editor, Bill Keller, falling victim to this campaign and issuing an apology uh, for something that, uh, that was defensible. The fact is that the New York Times was relying on the best available information they had. It became fashionable, though, for these major liberal papers to, to step back and say, oh, maybe we got too much caught up in this rush to war, so-called. Uh, that was just a, a desire to appease the liberal and left-wing critics of those papers. And it reminds me of when we were at the Washington Post annual meeting and I raised the question of why this paper had failed to tell the truth about the communists behind one of these anti-war demonstrations. And the publisher of the Washington Post, Bo Jones, said, oh, well, you know, we heard from you and your criticism, but we heard a lot more from those activists who wanted us to give these demonstrations even more attention and publicity. Well, that shows how they work. If they're getting more emails or letters or phone calls from these left-wing and liberal activists, they figure, even if they're a publisher or, or an editor, or reporter, that they somehow have to mollify or appease these people. Again, that's evidence of how they lose their bearings as objective news reporters. Yeah. It seems to me when you're proving your hypothesis, you need to disprove all competing null hypotheses. So how do you disprove that economic influence has no, no impact on the coverage? The, the smaller newsrooms, the lack of investigative reporters, you know, just in any, it seems like, how can you eliminate that as a possibility? I don't understand what the argument is. What is the argument that somehow an economic impact is dictating what? that the, the smaller newsrooms, that they're going to have more uh, event-driven coverage and less issue-based coverage. You're going to have more uh, beat reporting and less analysis. And do you see that as a trend? The problem I find with the press and the media in general is that there's too much analysis. What is called interpretive reporting has replaced old-fashioned old news reporting used to be who, what, when, where, why, and how, and now it's who, what, when, where, why, how, and so what, which opens the door to the liberal media biases of the particular reporters. Pardon me. The economics, uh, I don't think, play a role in, in when it comes to the Washington Post or the New York Times, which are the major newspapers in this country, the major national newspapers. The New York Times is a very profitable institution. I go to their annual meetings every year and I have to listen to Arthur Salzberger Jr. talk about how profitable the paper, the company is, really how, much, how, much, how much money they're making, and yet at the same time this was a paper through its editorial coverage 
that was adamantly against going to war in Iraq. It had no influence at all on their editorial uh, point of view. They were against the war. And among their reporters, uh, my guess is, I haven't interviewed them in detail, uh, that most of the reporters were probably against the war as well, but they covered it uh, to the extent they could. And yet, even that wasn't good enough, as I say, because the Times later would issue this virtual apology for supposedly tilting or slanting its coverage or not questioning some of their sources in the build-up to the war. Again, that was an attempt to placate the left-wing critics of the New York Times who are very vocal and very visible, and they, they have put a lot of pressure on these papers supposedly to come clean uh, now that they've raised questions about the aftermath of the war. But uh, a good example would be March 12th when Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Smart was found, and that's the top news story in all the major ABC, NBC, and CBS. How could that not be an economic issue? It's infotainment. How is that? We're, about, we're on the brink of war. Elizabeth Smart gets found. How is that liberal media bias? 